This lesson is on non-parametric and machine learning approaches to ecological forecasting. I'm Ethan Dial. I'm a research assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Boston University. And I'm going to give a few different modules. Uh, the first module is just to talk a little bit in overview about this exciting new avenue in ecological forecasting. Actually, that's a bit of a straw man. Uh, Non-parametric approaches aren't exactly new to ecological forecasting. Uh, at the very least, you can trace them back to a 1990 paper by George Sugihara and Robert May. And in that paper, they were using a very simple approach to forecasting that's also very powerful and is still being used today in current research. And that's this idea of using nearest neighbors. Basically, if you're trying to predict a continuous function, like the dynamics of a uh, population, or a ecosystem function, you can average previous observations of the dynamics when the system was in similar states. That's shown in this figure from Moore and Little for a spike train. You want to predict the time series at time t plus 1, shown there in the empty red square. And you're going to look at the recent history that led up to your prediction point, and then identify historical analogs where the sequence of dynamics was similar. So those are the two other sequences of blue squares. And then you're just going to average the dynamic evolution that was observed in those historical analogs, those red bordered blue squares. And this idea dates back to Edward Lorenz's work in climate and is also uh, equivalent more or less to what's called KNN nearest neighbors in, in pattern recognition. But in the 1990 paper, Sugihara and May used this approach to do short-term forecasting of measles, chickenpox, and daily phytoplankton counts. So more properly, this first module is just to discuss a little bit about an exciting avenue, not new. A little bit more of what to expect. After we give this overview, the second module will be, will be a bit of an up-close look at empirical dynamic modeling as a particular framework for non-parametric forecasting. The third module will be a case study looking at recruitment and marine fisheries with these empirical dynamic modeling tools. And the fourth module will just be a brief look at some other approaches. The main case study uh, we'll be looking at is recruitment and marine fisheries, but I'll also reference a few other studies uh, that you can explore on your own, including spatial recruitment of mussels and the timing of flowering in chickpea plants. Uh, the software packages that I'll be showing, I'll be showing you REDM, and then one of those other case studies has code available in Carrot if you're interested. A brief note about terminology. Um, there's a lot of different interrelated words, uh, machine learning, non-parametric, model-free, non-structural. These use, words get used in a lot of different ways. I'm not going to attempt to um, exactly define them here. Really, what we're focused on is an alternative to parametric forecasting. So if we look at um, the Dietz 2018 paper's um, general structure of an ecological forecast, right? you have some ecological quantity, y, that you're trying to predict. And you're predicting it as a function of the previous endogenous variables, exogenous drivers, um, variance in parameters, and observational error. And really, what we're going to be talking about today is when this function here isn't a combination of algebraic terms and y's and x's, but is instead created empirically from the data. And a lot of these sorts of non-parametric and machine learning approaches fall under the purview of something called universal function approximators. And um, this can include the nearest neighbor forecasting I just discussed briefly. It includes generalizations of regression, such as local linear regression and kernel regression. Also dynamic linear models, which will be covered in a different module. It can include artificial neural networks. It can include Gaussian processes. It can include random forests. There's a whole stable of different approaches, uh, each with their own strengths. But generally speaking, all of these can incorporate the endogenous and exogenous variables. Some of them treat the observation error implicitly, 
such as the nearest neighbors, you just are using averaging to treat it implicitly. Some of the approaches like Gaussian processes can treat it explicitly. But obviously the process uncertainty looks quite different when there's no explicit parameters. Why would you want to use a non-parametric approach? One case, and this is the motivation um, for our case study, is that there aren't necessarily good parametric equations. This can be because uh, you're having to make arbitrary choices in the model structure. There may be unknown or unmeasured variables that are acting interdependently. Or there may be an unmanageable parametric complexity when you try to piece apart the different mechanisms that are feeding into the process that you're trying to forecast. Another possibility is that you're seeking to integrate big data streams. Um, so for example, in the chickpea flowering um, case study that I'll reference later, they're trying to use genomics at it, uh, to reflect the genetic variation in individual level and integrate that into predictions. Uh, but this could also include non-traditional information such as posts and tweets, tweets and searches. Uh, to that end, um, Google had this idea um, about a decade ago that um, people Google their symptoms when they're starting to feel sick. And so the Google search data could potentially predict outbreaks of flu faster than traditional metrics like hospital cases. Um, ultimately, however, the, um, the project failed. Uh, it's been taken offline um, now for quite some time. And um, laser, I'll give a bit of a diagnostic on it. Uh, you can point your fingers at a lot of things, but ultimately, it's a word of caution here that data-driven methods are only as good as the data. And Laser et al. discuss a few things, including that people's search behavior is influenced by many things besides their own symptoms, such as media coverage. And Google's search machinery is ever-evolving, and the patterns reflect that. Of course, forecasting can also fail from overfitting. And... Um, this is a bit uh, different from how we think about uh, parametric models. The, the AIC or BIC um, goodness of fit metrics um, can be very hard to apply to non-parametric approaches where the degrees of freedom and the number of parameters are poorly defined. In some cases, such as uh, fancy artificial neural networks, it's easy to ob obtain an arbitrarily good fit to the data. And it's also important that the prediction point isn't included in its own training. So this makes cross-validation extremely important in non-parametric approaches. So in a few different um, parlances, you have a training set or maybe a library set where your model is, is given data uh, to generate the non-parametric framework. And then the forecast skill is evaluated on a separate set called a prediction set uh, often. And uh, sometimes this is done by just splitting the time series in half. It can be done by sp splitting it into quarters and leaving one quarter out and training on three quarters. Um, when the data are really limited, you can even just do leave one out cross-validation. And that's just when you're trying to predict time t, you leave that out of your training set, you generate the forecasting framework, and then you make your prediction with that data point that you held out of sample. That brings us to module two, which is an up-close look at empirical dynamic modeling. Empirical dynamic modeling is more than just a single non-parametric approach. It's more of a framework uh, that includes multiple different approaches and centers around identifying and studying low-dimensional nonlinear dynamics based on the underlying geometry of data. This animation illustrates the Lorentz attractor. The Lorentz is an example of a coupled dynamic system consisting of three differential equations where each component depends on the state and dynamics of the other two components. You can think of each component, for example, as being species, foxes, rabbits, grasses, and each one changes depending on the state of the other two. So these components, shown here as the axes, are actually the state variables or the Cartesian coordinates that form the state space. Notice that when the system is in one lobe, x and z are positively correlated, and when the system is in the other lobe, 
X and Z are negatively correlated, the other wing of the butterfly. We can view a time series thus as a projection from that manifold onto a coordinate axis of the state space. Here we see the projection onto axis X and the resulting time series recording displacements of X. This can be repeated on the other coordinate axes to generate other simultaneous time series. And so these time series are really just projections of the manifold dynamics onto coordinate axes. Conversely, we can recreate the manifold by projecting the individual time series back into the state space to create the flow. And in this panel, we can see the three time series, x, y, and z, each of which is really a projection of the motion on that manifold, and what we're doing is the opposite here. We are taking the time series and projecting them back into the original three-dimensional state space to recreate the manifold, the butterfly attractor. There's a very powerful theorem proven by Floris Tarkins that shows generically that one can reconstruct a shadow version of the original manifold simply by looking at one of its time series projections. For example, consider the three time series shown here. These are all copies of each other. They are all copies of variable legs. Each is displaced by an amount tau. So the top one is unlagged, the second one is lagged by tau, and the blue one at the bottom is lagged by 2 tau. Tarkin's theorem then says that we should be able to use these three time series as new coordinates and reconstruct a shadow version of the original butterfly manifold. So let's see how this works. This is the reconstructed manifold produced from lags of a single variable, and you can see that it actually does look fairly similar to the butterfly attractor. Each point in the three-dimensional reconstruction can be thought of as a time segment with different points capturing different segments of history of variable x. And the reconstructed manifold is then the library or collection of the historical behavior of x. The reconstruction preserves essential mathematical properties of the original system, such as the topology of the manifold and its Lyapunov exponents. More importantly, this method represents a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold, the butterfly attractor, and the reconstruction, allowing us to recover states of the original dynamic system by using lags of just a single time series. So again, the conceptual foundation of empirical dynamic modeling is to try to understand the underlying geometry of data. And the video introduced this idea of an attractor manifold. Now, if you just take a series of unrelated variables, in this case, x, y, and z that are Gaussian random noise, you don't get any emergent geometry because there's no underlying interaction. Now, there's nothing really there to study. But if you instead take some real ecological data, so this is from Mono Lake um, in California, it's a hypersaline lake with a very uh, simple ecosystem. You can see that there's emergent geometry and something that we can now study, for example, with the nearest neighbor forecasting or some of these other universal function approximators that I discussed in the first module. Now, if you don't have multiple time series to reconstruct the attractor from, or you're uncertain about the membership uh, of the functionally coupled unit, the video talked about using this idea of lag coordinates. And that's taking a time lag of a single variable and using that to unfold the multivariate dynamics of the system. And in this way, you can recover an attractor that you can still use uh, universal functions for approximation, for example, the nearest neighbors. This is similar in a parametric model that oftentimes you can rewrite a system of ODE equations in multiple variables into just a higher order ODE with uh, a single variable and its derivatives. So there's this natural relationship between time lags and derivatives that helps you uh, contextualize this against the parametric approach. And there's a relationship between causality and forecasting. Um, this was famously made by Clive Granger, uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And Granger um, put forward this notion of causality that said, 
if y is causing x, then our forecast should be better if we include y in our forecast than if we remove y. Now, unfortunately, this relies on separability between causes and effects that isn't applicable to a lot of realistic ecosystems. But with non-parametric approaches, the causality is very important for establishing system identification. You need to know what variables are reasonable to include in whatever sort of data-driven forecast you're making. Empirical dynamic modeling proposes convergent cross-mapping, and this is based on the notion that in nonlinear systems, the causes leave embedded information and effects that can be used to back out prediction. This is convergent cross-mapping, and we'll show another video uh, similar to the first one that explains this particular notion. Taken's theorem gives us a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold and reconstructed shadow manifolds. Here, we will explain how this important aspect of attractor reconstruction can be used to determine if two time series variables belong to the same dynamic system and are thus causally related. This particular reconstruction is based on lags of variable x. If we now do the same for variable y, we find something similar. Here, we see the original manifold m as well as the shadow manifolds mx and my created from lags of x and y respectively. Because both mx and my map one-to-one -to, -one to the original manifold m, they also map one-to-one -to, -one to each other. This implies that the points that are nearby on the manifold my correspond to points that are also nearby on mx. We can demonstrate this principle by finding the nearest neighbors in my and using their time indices to find the corresponding points in mx. These points will be nearest neighbors on mx only if x and y are causally related. Thus, we can use nearby points on my to identify nearby points on mx. This allows us to use the historical record of y to estimate the states of x and vice versa, a technique we call cross-mapping. With longer time series, the reconstructed manifolds are denser, nearest neighbors are closer, and the cross-map estimates increase in precision. We call this phenomenon convergent cross-mapping and use this convergence as a practical criterion for detecting causation. Now I want to dive into the case study. So this brings us to the third module, the case study on recruitment in marine fisheries. And just a little background on the problem. Um, the parametric approach to fisheries modeling and forecasting is traditionally done with an age-structured model. And um, we can see a little bit of how this plays out uh, with this classic figure from the 1926 paper by Hjort. So many fish stocks um, live over multiple years, and so the stock is composed of multiple age classes. And generally, uh, the models will assume a constant mortality between adult age classes, and then that only leaves uh, the recruitment, which is the new incoming age class each year, as something that needs to be forecast. And the recruitment can be much more variable. And for this, uh, there's a few different parametric forms that are commonly used in fisheries. This includes the Ricker, the Beverton Holt, and the Schnoody model. Uh, here uh, written out is the Beverton Holt form. So it says basically that the recruitment is a function of the spawning stock biomass. Um, at a previous year um, set by the reproductive delay of the, of the species. And it assumes that there's constant predation on the juveniles and that there's a linear rate of competition for food between juveniles. Now in practice, the stock recruitment relationships often result in um, very poor fits. So here I'm showing data from Atlantic Menhaden. That's a forage fish that lives um, along the east coast of the United States. And in the case of Atlantic Menhaden, the parametric fits uh, do no better at explaining the variance than just a simple median forecast. This is a particularly bad example, but it's, it's really quite common to see these sort of shotgun blasts where there's supposed to be a, a, a neat parametric relationship. And there's two different hypotheses that are often invoked to explain poor fits. One is that the measurements of recruits are too uncertain or too un incomplete. This is to say that the system's dominated by observation error. Uh, 
The other is to invoke stochastic environmental factors. Uh, and that's to say that recruitment is driven by process error. But there's another possibility that hasn't always been adequately entertained. And that's that the structural models, these stock relationship, uh, stock recruitment relationships are wrong or at least incomplete. Uh, what do I mean by this? So this is a model example. And um, these data are, are generated by me uh, using a parametric model of stock and recruitment. And overall, the system, uh, the, the spread of the data, the variance, uh, looks similar to the real data. So we'd say maybe, oh, well, you've added observation error or you've added process error. And that's not exactly true because if we attempt to unfold these data, in fact, the, the model is completely deterministic. It's just that I've taken the Ricker model of recruitment and I've just added another variable, which is a predator preying on the juveniles. So the spread isn't the result of, of process error per se. It's not because the coefficients in the Ricker part were wrong. It's because we missed a variable. And the ideas from empirical dynamics let us recover this, even though we hadn't measured this hidden predator abundance. Instead, we just took a time lag of one of the observed variables, and this allowed us to consider the system as three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional. So there have been several recent studies trying to push forward this non-parametric approach to forecasting recruitment. There's a paper in ICES, uh, 2018, by Pierre et al., a paper in Fish and Fisheries by Munch, Garon, Nava, and Sugihara in 2018, and then a very recently published uh, paper in Scientific Reports by Garon, Nava uh, et al. And I'm going to discuss a bit the results from the Munch paper, but first, I want to show how the first steps in this sort of analysis look with a hands-on worked example. So the R script that reproduces the commands I'm going to be using is included in the course GitHub. Uh, so you're invited to follow along if you can, but you can also go back later and do it uh, on your own. First, I'm going to show everyone how to install the REDM package, and then I will briefly run through the vignette that gives us an overview of the functionality of the package. After that, we're going to run through uh, some actual computations with the package. So first, um, so everybody knows what I'm working with. Uh, this is my session info, so I'm using R3.6, and it's installed on Mac OS 10.14. And a little bit of explanation, uh, I'm going to be installing an older version of REDM. It's a stable version, and uh, the current version's going through um, iterations and prepare for uh, a new launch. So what I'm going to do is install the older version of the package in a, a different library folder. So this is something that you can do if you have an REDM installation already, and you don't want to overwrite that version. Um, otherwise, you can just use the regular install GitHub command here without the uh, libpaths wrapper. Of course, I already have this uh, installed, so nothing's going to happen. And now uh, I'm going to load in our EDM. But of course, I need to specify that I'm going to use this alternative library location. OK, and nicely, when we load in the package, it invites us to look at the vignette. So we'll do just that. So this version was launched uh, about two years ago. Again, there's uh, new versions coming out now. Um, but for the purpose of the video, I wanted to go with a stable version. The new release of the package should uh, have all the same functionalities. There may be a few changes in syntax due to changing the underlying code. The introduction uh, gives you a different take on some of the things that we've already talked about, uh, the ideas of tractor reconstruction and Taken's theorem. 
And then um, there's a series of examples that highlight different functionalities. Some of these are model-based. So the first example here uses uh, this classical uh, one-dimensional nonlinear map called the tent map. Uh, but if you go to later sections, you will find that uh, there's some um, data included with the package uh, to work through some empirical examples. I won't do that here. Uh, all that's in the vignette, and you're welcome to do that uh, on your own. Included are uh, explanations about multivariate embedding, multi-view embedding, convergent cross-mapping, time delay convergent cross-mapping, And they also include issues such as resolving um, effects with confounding seasonality. So that's uh, down here in the apple blossom thrips example. So again, feel free to check that out on your own. Um, now that we've installed our ADM and taken a brief look through the tutorial, I want to get to uh, the example that will reproduce just a little bit of the analysis that's in the Munch et al. paper uh, we've been discussing. So I do want to load one other package. This is the Tidyverse package, and I'm going to try to be uh, conservative with my use of Tidyverse, but it's really sort of an indispensable tool for uh, data science analysis in R. It provides some additional grammars. Uh, that let you string operations on data together in ways that make analysis a lot easier and make plotting a lot easier. Uh, it includes ggplot, tidier, and diplier. Uh, I believe those are the only pieces, as well as tibble, that we'll actually be using today. Uh, but if you do library tidyverse, you get everything all together. And what I'm going to do is load in data that I downloaded from um, the Ram Myers legacy database. And the legacy database is hosted now um, in Zenodo. So this is the um, this is the open access data archive that's supported by CERN. And uh, you'll see the link here. It'll be provided as well. And um, in particular, the, um, the database includes um, R formats that make this really convenient. I've already downloaded these. Um, here and there are um, the pieces of the data we'll be working with provided in the GitHub. So to keep our workspace tidy, I'm going to um, I'm going to load the database into its own environment, and I'm currently um, within the folder that this uh, file is located in, so I don't need to provide additional path. And again, we're going to load it into this new environment. And we can list the contents that have loaded in. There's a bunch of different pieces uh, here. It's all data on the same stocks, but in sort of different dimensionalities. So you'll see that the um, SSB data object, for example, has 69 rows and 957 columns. And you'll see that some of the other data objects are, oops, I picked the wrong one. Some of the other data objects are just uh, vectors of length 957. So for example, common name, 957. So this database has 957 different stocks. Uh, and some of these objects are just uh, metadata on those stocks. Other objects are time series data. <clears throat> 
We're concerned with the stock and recruitment data, so I'm going to pull that out explicitly into um, the main variable environment. So I'm going to pull out the recruitment data frame. Uh, so you'll see that here, 69 observations of 957 variables. And I'm going to do the same for the spawning stock biomass. Same dimensions. To see what that data looked like, Sorry, let me avoid using a uh, tidy notation when possible. That's not going to work. So let's take a look at one of the data frames. It's got lots of rows, so I don't want to show you everything. Let's just look at the first five rows and the first five columns. You'll see here the columns are named by the stock identifier and the rows are named by year. I only want to show you guys a subset of the data. This is a very large uh, data set and um, not a very good example to, to run that large scale of an example. So what I want to do is filter it down um, to a few interesting stocks. So the first thing is I'm going to count the number of recruitment measurements for each variable. I'm using the Diplier uh, summarize command. So it's this is like an apply, but in a little bit more of a data frame uh, friendly grammar. So uh, on the first five columns, you'll see that, in fact, there's no recruitment data on several species, and then other species have nearly uh, the full time series measured. We're going to do the same thing for the spawning stock biomass. And then lastly, uh, I want to pull out particular taxonomic group. So um, this is one of the vector objects in the database. We're going to pull that out. So we're pulling it out as a character string. And this just contains uh, the broad taxonomic grouping of each of the stocks, each of the 957 stocks. And in particular today, uh, I want to run through forage fish examples. And we're just going to focus on a subset which have at least 50 recruitment measures, 50 spawning stock biomass measures, and as I said, are designated as forage fish. So that gives us um, 12 column indices that correspond to the stocks that match all of those criteria. And we can pull out the stock IDs of those. And take a look. So as it turns out, it's, um, it's a lot of herring stocks across uh, different management areas, as well as Atlantic Menhaden and the Japanese pilchard uh, sardine. And again, we sort of have our information scattered across multiple data frames. So what we're going to do is uh, use a bit of Diplier language to pull this together into a data frame object. So we're going to only take the columns that correspond to the forage fish from recruitment. And additionally, we're going to um, pull out the row names, uh, since those are actually the years, into their own column. And then we want to work with uh, long data instead of uh, wide data. So what we're going to do is, because 
each of the columns is really just a measurement of the same variable, which is recruitment, just designating different stocks. What we're going to do is we're going to pull together all the recruitment uh, measurements in a single column, and then we're going to create an additional key column that specifies which stock that's a measurement for. So um, we're going to pivot longer. We're going to pivot everything uh, but the year column. The key that's going to tell us which stock is which, we're going to call stock ID. And the values we're going to put in a col column designated R, since this is recruitment. Let's see what that looks like first. So now, instead of having uh, an object that's 69 observations long, uh, we have a much longer data frame. But each year has multiple recruitment measurements corresponding to different stocks. And of course, uh, we actually wanted to put that all together. So we're going to do the same thing with the spawning stock biomass. And then we're going to join them together. So here's what I just wrote for recruitment. And here's the same thing, um, but for the spawning stock biomass data frame. And we're going to join by year and stock ID. And you can see what that gives us. So now we have multiple measurements for each year of recruitment and biomass specified by um, unique to a stock ID. And just for organization's sake, we're going to do two things. One is we're going to convert uh, the year from a character to a numeric. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to sort by stock ID instead of year. So same data as before, but just a little bit of convenient reformatting. So this long data format is convenient for a lot of analysis. Uh, it's very convenient when using with ggplot. So if we want to look at these data, we can use ggplot, take our new combined data frame, and uh, we want to look at the stock and recruitment time series across these different species. So on the x-axis will be year, on the y-axis will be spawning stock biomass. We're going to show these as lines. And then we want a separate plot for each of the stock IDs. So we're going to use this command facet wrap stock ID to create a bunch of sub panels um, so that the data in each panel is unique to a stock ID. It looks like we have very little data in most of these, but that's just because I forgot a command. We're going to use free scaling uh, since the absolute levels um, vary quite a bit across the stocks. OK, so now we can see the spawning stock biomass for these different stocks. Um, some big differences. Several of them show large collapses, some of which rebounded. Uh, the Japanese pilchard really um, is dominated by just a single boom and bust cycle. And we can do the same thing for recruitment. So I'm just going to replace Y with uh, R instead of SSB. And you'll see, you'll notice that um, the recruitment time series uh, have a much higher variability year to year than the uh, spawning stock biomass. And of course, the sort of uh, holy grail that we're chasing is predicting recruitment. And again, traditionally, this is done with the spawning stock. So now 
uh, I'm going to change the command, and we're going to plot spawning stock biomass on the x-axis and recruitment on the y-axis. I'm going to show uh, we're going to show the shotgun blast. So some of these do show um, some areas where um, the recruitment is explained well by the stock. But generally speaking, this is sort of more of the same of what I showed before. The one-dimensional relationship between uh, stock and recruitment is highly variable. And again, the traditional explanations for that variability uh, usually are some mixture of invoking observation error and invoking quote unquote process error due to stochastic environmental forcing. So I'm gonna focus on hair SOG. This is one of the substocks of herring uh, confined to a particular region. And it's not entirely a random choice. Uh, it turns out to be a, a, a decent example. And so the first thing we'll do is we'll pull out just the subset of this long data frame where we have data on the hair SOG stock. Right? So I'm going to use a bit of Diplier notation here. We're going to input this data frame, and then we're going to filter it so that we're only selecting rows where the stock ID column contains this value. And then at that point, we don't need the stock ID anymore. We can look at this. Now I want to note that um, at, the, at the top and the bottom of this data frame, so if you look at the tail, there's some missing values. So in the database, there's no values of recruitment measured in these final several years. And this can create a few problems uh, with analysis down the road. So I want to make one additional change. And I'm going to append filter complete cases. This is going to pull out those NA rows. Uh, all the NAs are sequential in this one. You do need to be careful if you change the time step between things by um, deleting columns in the middle of a time series. And we're going to perform a univariate forecasting analysis on the recruitment time series for this herring stock. And to do that, we're going to use the nearest neighbor forecasting tool, um, simplex projection. And so for the univariate analysis in the REDM package, there's a function called simplex. And this is going to um, make nearest neighbor predictions of all the points in the time series. We can make some adjustments. We can tell it to split the time series up so that we use part for library, part for prediction. Or if we use the default where all of the library where all of the time series is used for library and prediction, the software will automatically implement leave one out cross validation. There's a few other uh, parameters that we'll address uh, in a few minutes. And by default, the simplex projection code is going to make forecasts for embedding dimensions of 1 to 10. So this is varying the number of lag coordinates being used to try to uh, fill out this trajectory. But we're happy with the default values here for our analysis. So all we need to do is tell it which time series to run in. The program has very helpfully let us know that because the library and prediction sets overlap, it will automatically be doing cross-validation. And we can look at the output. So each row corresponds to a different embedding dimension, since we ran over embedding dimensions of 1 to 10. And then it contains information on the number of neighbors used in the simplex projection, the number of predictions that were made, and then forecast skill measurements, including Pearson's correlation coefficient rows. So that's the correlation between observed and simplex prediction 
values. There's the mean absolute error between observed and predicted and the root mean squared error between observed and predicted. So we can turn to ggplot. This is a data frame and works very well. And we're going to look across the E values at the forecast scale. And I'm going to put in the color simplex here because we want to add another line. You'll notice that um, the later columns of the output contain these constant predictor stats. So the constant predictor is also called the naive predictor. And this is really just using the autocorrelation in the time series uh, to make a very basic forecast that what you measure tomorrow will be the same thing as what you measured today. And it's an important baseline um, for time series forecasting um, that'll probably come up in other parts of this summer course. To make a fix there. And what you can see is that the forecast skill with simplex improves with embedding dimension. So as you try to unfold the dynamics, you get better measurements. And importantly, the simplex production forecasts are better than the naive predictor with the constant um, constant dynamics. So this really indicates that there is additional dynamics in the time series beyond just the inertia. Uh, of course, we can look at um, MAE instead of rho. Gives us a slightly different picture. And now the lower the error, the better the forecast skill. So again, we see the same picture, that increasing the embedding dimension improves forecast skill, and that the simplex predictions are better than the naive predictors. Again, there's evidence of additional dynamics beyond just the inertia of the time series. We can do the same procedure, but now looking at the spawning stock biomass. So we're going to use the simplex function again, but now um, we're going to apply it to the spawning stock biomass values. Again, we get the same indication that cross-validation is being used. And we can use our same plotting, just change to our new output um, data. And we see a different picture here. The spawning stock biomass has more autocorrelation in it, and the simplex predictions here are not showing any um, additional predictability on top of the slowly varying nature of the spawning stock biomass. Now, in some cases, it's possible to look over a longer time horizon. So we can actually go back to simplex and, and address some of these other parameters. You'll notice there's values tau and tp here. Tau is the separation between time lags. And if you have an oversampled system, so you have a system where each time step is changing very slowly, it can be helpful to, to use a larger tau. And the prediction time is similar. And this is just how many steps in the future you're predicting. So we can make another attempt at predicting spawning stock biomass, but now we'll do it with uh, two time steps, in this case two years between time lags, and we'll try to predict two years out in the future. Uh, we can plot the same thing again, but now for our try number two. Now we see, when we look over a longer prediction time, the autocorrelation of the time series has decreased. Now it's more like 0.8 instead of 0.9. And this is the, the lag 2 autocorrelation instead of the lag 1, because we're looking two time steps ahead. And this seems to indicate that taking a, a longer time scale, there is evidence of additional dynamics. However, there's something we have to be very careful about, which is we were using cross-validation. And you'll notice it says with exclusion radius of 0. And we'll look back at simplex one more time and note that leave one out cross-validation when, uh, when you're using a larger prediction time or a larger tau, 
really isn't the smartest way to go because you're saying that predictions uh, that data one time step away are really nearly identical. And that's why we're using a larger time step. So it's better when you're using a tau of two to use an exclusion radius of at least one. So that's going to exclude one year ahead and one year behind. And if this predictability we're measuring is really is really meaningful, then we should still see the same predictability. Sorry, I meant to save that to try number two, uh, number three, and we'll plot here. Now the autocorrelation doesn't change uh, since the exclusion radius is only for the simplex predictions, but now our simplex predictability has gone down a lot, which means that. What we saw before was driven by basically just using nearest neighbors that were adjacent in time. So the predictability we measured with try number two wasn't really that meaningful. And the picture that we get from this is that the spawning stock biomass of this herring stock is slowly varying and we're not really seeing additional dynamics on top of that that give us additional forecast skill. Of course, predicting recruitment is what we were really worried about. And that is where we saw a clear benefit of the simplex forecasts. Now, the real holy grail that people are concerned about is, is predicting recruitment using parametric models of spawning stock biomass. And that has led to this question, when it fails, if spawning stock biomass really does have an effect on recruitment. And so this is where we turn to the causality test convergent cross mapping. And in the REDM package, this is done using the CCM function. And now instead of inputting a single time series, we're implicating a block of data. And this is what we already have with DF Herring. We have the two time series that we're interested in testing causality between uh, together in a block. So we'll make a new output object and we'll store the output of a CCM calculations. And here we want to see if spawning stock biomass left a causal signature in recruitment. And so in CCM language, that means can we predict spawning stock biomass using the embedded information in recruitment? So our target column will be spawning stock biomass and we'll be reconstructing the attractor with the recruitment. And the univariate analysis showed an embedding dimension of nine was needed to unfold the dynamics. So we'll use that here. And we're going to use uh, random libraries, but we're not going to reuse uh, library vectors. So you notice by default, uh, the CCM is going to attempt to do cross mapping at different library sizes. Prediction improving with library sizes is an important check that the information you're recovering is more than just a statistical artifact. In this case, we only have about 60 data points. So um, the warning is just letting us know that it terminated at the largest possible library size and it wasn't able to do um, the full length of input library sizes. And we can look at our output. And basically, we have 100 different samples for each library size. So our CCM output has uh, 500 rows. And um, each library size has 10, 10 measurements. And so these are the forecast skills of doing the cross prediction, that is, prediction spawning stock biomass from recruitment. What we're really interested in is the average prediction skill as a function of library size. And EDM, our EDM has a function in it called CCM means. Of course, we could we could just use uh, for loops or, or other basic tools to do this, but this is a convenient wrapper. And it's going to give us the summary that we're interested in. So we'll store this in a new data object. And all we're going to do is call the CCM means function on our CCM output. And now you'll see uh, we have a single row for each library size, ROW row. And again, uh, we'll use ggplot um, since we're working in data frames. 
and we'll look at library size on the x-axis and the Pearson's correlation coefficient between the cross-predicted values and the observed values. What we see is there's very high forecast scale, right? This is a Pearson's correlation coefficient of, of 0.8. So that's equivalent to an R squared value. And the forecast scale is improving with library size, which is uh, an important check that, again, we're not just looking at a statistical artifact. So CCM shows a strong cross-map predictability of spawning stock biomass from recruitment. So what that means is that recruitment contains information about spawning stock biomass, and we take that to mean there's a causal effect of spawning stock biomass on recruitment. Now, these levels of Pearson's correlation coefficient are quite high. Remember, Pearson's correlation goes from zero uh, for a meaningless forecast to one for a perfect forecast. And if we wanted to assess the significance, we might be tempted to look in a biostatistics textbook like Czar and look up a critical value based on the number of predictions that we've made, right? So our largest prediction set is about 60. And certainly a 0.8 row value is statistically significant in that sense. Uh, but those sorts of uh, basic statistical measures of significance can be really misleading uh, in time series analysis, in non-parametric uh, forecasting methods. And so what we do a lot of times is we apply a surrogate test. So what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the analysis that we just did many times, but for a surrogate time series, which preserves some simple properties of the time series while randomizing all the other information in it. And in particular, we can use something called Ebizuzaki surrogate methods to preserve the autocorrelation structure of the time series, but randomize the phases. And this is going to give us time series that have strong autocorrelation, but should have all other connections between each other destroyed. And conveniently, our EDM contains a function called make surrogates. make surrogate data. And this is a wrapper for, um, for several subroutines using a couple of different methods. And again, I want to focus on the Ebisuzaki method, which creates surrogates by randomizing the phases of the Fourier transfer form. The first thing I'm going to do is set the seed of the random number generator so that we all get the same surrogate time series. And then what I'm going to do is generate a single surrogate time series of recruitment and store it in a vector. And I actually want to be able to view that side by side with the true values. So I'm going to bind it into a new data frame that has the observed data as well as this new surrogate time series. And we can look at these side by side with ggplot. So taking this new data frame as input, we're going to look at the time series along the year. In one color, we're going to look at the true values, and in another color, we're going to look at the surrogate values. And what you'll see is that the time series look uh, fairly similar to each other qualitatively. They vary on about the same time scales, but the values have been, have been shuffled around. So these are two different time series that contain uh, different information. And what we want to do is see if this a uh, surrogate time series can predict uh, through cross mapping the spawning stock biomass at the same level that we observed for the true values. If that's the case, then we know it, it's just the simple statistical properties of the time series that gave us this predictability, and the predictability isn't significant um, in a deeper way than that. So we're going to repeat the CCM analysis that we did before storing it in a new data object. Now, of course, we need to input our new data frame. Our target column is still going to be the spawning stock biomass. But our library column now 
is going to be the surrogate recruitment data. We're still going to use an E of 9. We're still going to use the same sort of random libraries. We get the same errors that we got before, or warning messages rather, about cross-validation and exceeding the maximum library size. And again, we're mostly just interested in the mean values. So we're going to call CCM means on this new output. And now we're going to go to ggplot and we're going to plot these two means together. Now what we see is that there is some cross prediction possible from the surrogate uh, recruitment time series. Again, we're predicting something that has very strong autocorrelation. So there's sort of an inherent predictability due to that. That's not really what we're interested in. But we can see that the true values cross predict much, much better than the surrogate values. And this is basically what we're hoping to show with the surrogate analysis. For a rigorous analysis, what we want to do is we actually want to repeat this for many, many different surrogate values. And that'll give us an empirical error distribution under the null hypothesis that is just the basic statistical um, properties of the time series, the Fourier spectrum, responsible for the cross-mapping and not actually a deeper dynamic connection. <coughs> so let's reset the seed. And now we're going to take that analysis and we're basically just going to wrap it up in a function so that we can repeat it many, many times. So we'll call it do one surrogate of recruitment. And it's a function, in this case, it doesn't really need any inputs because we're going to be generating a random time series each time. And it doesn't really need an input because we're just using a random number generator in the end. And so I'm basically just going to copy and paste in what we just did, making sure that we return the summary statistics. So we'll make a single surrogate time series. We'll combine it into a data frame with the true data. We'll run CCM using the observed spawning stock biomass as the target, and the library will be this um, iteratively generated surrogate. And then we'll compute the, the CCM means and return that. And now we could write a for loop or um, several of the other available constructions in R. I'm going to use a map from the per package. Since that will nicely package everything um, in one big data frame when we get done. So we're going to do 100 surrogates. And we're just going to um, continually call this function. And the mapdf is going to concatenate all of the different um, CCM means outputs into a single data frame. It'll take a minute because we're doing 100 times more of the calculations that we were doing before. And now we can use ggplot to have a look at the true CCM measurement against a distribution of CCM uh, surrogate predictions. So we'll take the summary CCM surrogates. And again, we're going to look at library size on the x-axis and the Pearson's correlation coefficient measuring the forecast skill of the cross map on the y-axis. I'm going to put these in as box plots, but there's obviously a lot of other ways to plot this. Now we're using the surrogate data. And we make sure to put in um, group so that our box plots come out right. There's a lot of variance in the um, in the cross map skill of the surrogates, but you can see that the true time series is um, well outside the quantiles of the surrogate test. <clears throat>
Again, if we went to czar and we looked up the critical values of Pearson's correlation coefficient, we would have gotten something substantially lower because that wouldn't account for the autocorrelation and inherent predictability of the spotting stock biomass, nor really the complicated behavior of the CCM measurements. So Munch et al. in their 2018 paper did a similar sort of analysis to what we just ran through, but across 100 different stocks in the Ram Myers legacy database. And just like the Pierre et al. paper that I mentioned, they find that despite the frequent poor fits of stock recruitment relationships, that convergent cross-mapping does identify causality between stock and recruitment in many fisheries. They also looked at the fundamental predictability or forecastability of recruitment. And they did something a little bit fancier than the simpler, simplex projection that we looked at. They used something I brought up before called Gaussian processes. So this is a nonlinear function approximation technique that has a Bayesian formulation. So it's similar to simplex or the um, sequentially weighted local nonlinear maps with SMAP, but it allows for automatic relevance detection of lags and variables hierarchical modeling when you have multiple time series of stocks that you think share some but not all dynamics, and for explicitly treating observational error. The result I want to highlight here is the comparison they did between the parametric approach and the Gaussian processes uh, forecast. So here we're looking at uh, what I've circled here in orange. And so each point is um, the error in forecasts for an individual stock using the Gaussian process, non-parametric approach compared to the beverton holt parametric model. And they're comparing the scaled mean squared error. So that's the mean, the mean squared error divided by the deviations from the sample mean. And you'll see this is the one-to-one -one line where you get the same error for the parametric and non-parametric approaches, you'll see that in almost every case, the non-parametric approach has lower error than the parametric approach. And in many cases, it's much, much better. You have cases where the beverton holt uh, is no better than just a mean forecast, while the EDM forecast has just a fraction of that error. There are several takeaways in the paper. Um, it speaks to something I've brought up before. So if you look at figure 2C in that paper, you'll see the fraction of recruitment predicted as a function of the time series length scaled by the age at maturation of that species, which is an indicator of sort of how much inertia there is in the, in the stock. And with data-driven approaches, they can only be as good as the data. And if you haven't observed much variability, then there's only so much you can learn from the data. And the successful non-parametric prediction was strongly related to the effective time series length. You'll see that the, the, um, the slowly changing species that have a long age of maturation, the scorpaniforms, this includes rockfish that can live for hundreds of years that don't reach sexual maturity uh, for several decades, on the one hand, and then uh, clupeids like sardine and anchovy that have very rapid uh, population dynamics in comparison. And there's actually really practical good news here because the species where forecasting recruitment is most important to management are the species that have very fast time scales. So there's something very, very practical about this result. In general, the non-parametric approach let us sidestep the assumptions that have become hidden by the familiarity of the parametric models, that stock is the only uh, effect on recruitment, and it let time, stat time lags stand in for unidentified or unmeasured variables without having to assume them away. The newspaper brings up an additional point of interest, particularly in fisheries. So I just was discussing, and, and also in the case of, of Google Flu, that data-driven methods are only as good as the data, but parametric approaches also often rely on fits to data for deciding parameter values. And in fishery, there is a problem that the data, quote unquote, that are being fit and then predicted aren't really direct data, but in fact have been synthesized from observations through the very model structure that's being fit. This gives them sort of a, a circular advantage um, 
that's that's really uh, imagined. When you remove the circularity and instead predict raw data, the parametric approaches do much, much worse than on the synthetic data, but the EDM approach is still exactly as successful. So finally, that brings us to the fourth module, um, where I'm just going to briefly discuss some other approaches to non-parametric and machine learning. So I've mostly been talking in the language of non-parametric forecasting. The concept of machine learning at this point is pretty broadly defined. It involves taking data, doing something algorithmic to it, and making predictions or decisions from it. You can see uh, the sort of vast menagerie that machine learning encompasses right now, uh, drawn out um, and borrowed from Cognub, which is an uh, industry company. And forecasting, uh, certainly how we've been talking about it, generally falls under the supervised learning label, um, since the forecast skill is a fixed criterion for evaluating success. So that's more or less what defines supervised learning. And there's other branches of machine learning that can aid ecological forecasting, even if they don't explicitly accomplish forecasting themselves. For example, it's pretty common practice to apply dimensionality reduction of one sort or another in trying to incorporate environmental data into ecological forecasts. And so there's a lot out here to explore. I, I think the most important thing uh, to start out with is to ask, what was this technique designed for? Because the answer is not often going to be forecasting temporal change. Um, a lot of machine learning approaches are designed, for example, to, to classification problems where you're predicting categorical data rather than continuous data. So boosted regression trees are, um, are another sort of technique that sort of falls in between the purview of what we've been talking about and um, machine learning more broadly. It's based on the idea of regression trees, so sequentially dividing variables up. Maybe they're originally categorical data or you're using uh, breakpoints to turn a continuous variable into a discrete categorical variable. And this has been uh, combined with um, the idea of boosting, which is to sequentially reduce the prediction area through adding more and more models, in this case, regression trees. And um, if you're interested more in about this, I would, I would highly advocate checking out Barbara Hahn's talk on YouTube from um, the Neon Lecture Series that was done uh, just recently. The link's provided here. And in Barbara Hahn's case, she was ultimately interested in a categorical prediction, which was taking traits and information about species and trying to predict if that species was a, a pathogen carrier of a human uh, illness. If you're interested in a hands-on example, um, I'll draw your attention to this paper by Atala and Forrest. And so they're also using boosted regression, but to try and make spatiotemporal forecasts of muscle recruitment in New Zealand. So they have collected survey data by putting out these braids, and then they're counting um, which braids in which locations have muscles settling on them. And um, they have their code shared at the GitHub link, and they use a package that has several different machine learning algorithms. The package is called Carrot. It even has a KNN nearest neighbor algorithm. Another technique I just wanted to briefly draw attention to is this idea of symbolic regression. And it's machine learning, but it's not exactly non-parametric. And here, we're still thinking about um, our forecast in terms of some um, functions, some unspecified functions. But instead of just using a data representation for the function, you're actually determining an algebraic form, but the functional forms are explored through an evolution algorithm. So in some sense, this is, um, this is a different branch of machine learning, um, the sort of uh, recursive learning branch. And I'll draw attention to a recent paper here um, that used this idea of symbolic regression to try and derive a function for predicting the time to flowering in chickpeas. And this is incorporating climate drivers, but it's also incorporating genetic variation across the, chick, the wild chickpeas. And what they end up getting out is uh, this 12-term um, behemoth where there's um, genetic factors, there's temperature factors, and other things all put together. 
And if you want to dig into that, um, they also have their code hosted on, on um, in this case, GitLab. I haven't looked at the code personally. They ended up doing their own coding in C++. Um, but if this is something that interests you, go ahead and check it out.